Um, so yes, I am. I'm glad that my uh, my journey went from Tyndale Seminary, Batuvedorp, to to Cambridge. And okay, I got stuck in Cambridge. I'm, I'm sorry for for that. But I'm ever so pleased to uh, to be able to come back for this. So we're going to our second lecture. And what we have done so far is relatively simple. We have painted a picture in which the early church was taught by the apostles about the life and teaching of Jesus. And we have seen from the letters these apostles wrote that they use fragments of Jesus' teaching, mostly without explicitly acknowledging that they were using his words. And there is a natural ease about doing this, which is perhaps best explained by accepting what the New Testament tells us, namely that Jesus promised the Spirit who would remind the disciples of everything he had said, and that the apostles subsequently taught this to the church. We've also seen that the coming of the Spirit and his work of writing God's word on the heart of believers stand in contrast to how God's word came to his people under the old covenant. There it was Moses who brought down the law written on tablets of stone by God himself. The new covenant, on the other hand, starts with a more inward change, namely the circumcision of the heart, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the new birth, the writing of God's word on tablets of flesh. In the second lecture, we will try and see if we can uncover more about what the church had learned from the apostles about Jesus. And my goal is to arrive at a point that we are prepared to accept the possibility that the four Gospels are fundamentally, fundamentally is the operating word here, fundamentally little else than a written record of the Apostles' teaching. We're going to qualify this, but that's basically where we're working to. That is, the best way to understand what the Apostles taught about Jesus is by reading the Gospels. Now, of course, something happens when teaching that was mainly remembered becomes written scripture. And I do not want to downplay the importance and the effect of this writing down. But I believe it will help us to appreciate the fundamental unity of scripture when we see that the letters were written against the background of the knowledge about Jesus that we find in the Gospels. Or to put it extremely stark, the most important background to the letters of the apostles is perhaps not the Greco-Roman background, it is not the contemporary Jewish background, it is perhaps not even the Old Testament background, but it is the life and ministry and teaching of Jesus. Now I'm not sure, sure if I agree here with myself, and it's not a kind of, it's an extreme way of putting it, but I say this to make the point clear. No? The background of Jesus' life and teaching is anyway the one that is most often ignored when reading the letters, and that's why I put so much emphasis on this. On this. The life and words of Jesus may not have been written down till after many of the New Testament letters were written, the life and words of Jesus were certainly uh, going around. So we're going beyond the mere, mere references to Jesus' words. So we had quite a bit of the teaching of Jesus and we found how that teaching is reflected in the letters. And what I've given you is just examples. We could multiply these examples. Um, and we finished the first session with a rapid-fire comparison of statements in the letters that go back to the explicit teaching of Jesus. What we will do now is to think about the miracles that Jesus did and about the parables he taught. Do these come back in the letters? Now, and after that, we are going to ponder a little bit, bit about what form the churches knew the teaching. So, 
did they know about Jesus' teaching or did they know about Jesus' teaching or did they know what Jesus said more or less in the same way that all of us know uh, in the form of Bible verses, for example. But we will start with the miracles of Jesus. Where do we find reference to the miracles of Jesus outside the Gospels themselves? Uh, now, from the Gospels, it is clear that Jesus did many miracles, actions that amazed people. Kind of know that is the background to the, to the Latin word mirabilis, things that amaze you. No, Jesus healed. He fed large crowds from only a few loaves and some fish. He walked on water. He raised some people from the dead. But it is remarkable, though, that none of these miracles, apart from the resurrection, is ever referred to openly in the letters of James, Peter, Paul, and the others. I mean, the only references we get to Jesus as a miracle worker are a few references in the book of Acts. And the first one is in Acts 22. Let's see. Yes, there we are. 222 where Peter opens his uh, address on Pentecost, saying, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. So we get here three words, basically, summing up what Jesus did. Mighty works, wonders, and signs. And these three works, uh, words or come back more uh, or less a couple of times. Now, how does Peter describe the function of these mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in the midst of the men of Israel? Is it that God, by these works, uh, it is, sorry, that's the answer, it is that God, by these works, attested Jesus to the people? Or, no, attested in the sense of setting forth. The function of the miracles, according to Peter here, is that Jesus was established there as a man and God was with him. Undoubtedly, the miracles that are recorded in the Gospels do more than simple demonstrate that God shows the people that Jesus is the Messiah and the one sent by God. No. But these miracles are selected for inclusion because they teach us about who Jesus is and who and how he saves. And of course, for those people who experienced those miracles, they had tremendous practical benefits. But the significance of the works that Jesus was, that, that Jesus did, was that of showing the divine endorsement of his ministry. As Jesus had claimed himself, for example, in John 10, if I am not doing the works of my father, no, uh, don't believe me, but... Uh, if you don't believe me, believe me on the works men themselves, for example. Or believe me that I am in the Father, and again, uh, believe me on account of the works themselves. The second reference to Jesus' miracles is in Acts chapter 10, where we read uh, you know, Peter talking to, uh, to Cornelius, um, uh, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. We've read these words already this morning. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Peter does not give much by way of interpretation of Jesus' ministry, except saying that Jesus did good works and healed those that were oppressed by the devil. Why? Because God was with him. 
The miracles here are not given any further importance other than that they demonstrate God's seal of approval on Jesus' life and ministry. God was with him. And even Nicodemus in John 3 verse 1 and 2 more or less acknowledges that, that no one can do these things unless God is with him. So that is the open first uh, goal or importance signal of the miracles. Now, therefore, it is not all that remarkable that Paul does not refer to Jesus' miracles, for example, in the synagogue speech in Antioch uh, in Acts 13. Likewise, in Acts 17, Paul doesn't mention only one sign that God did, and that is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The works, wonders and signs that Jesus did during his ministry show that God was with him, demonstrate that Jesus really was the promised one. But they do not form an integral part of the subsequent proclamation of the gospel. They become much more prominent in understanding Jesus himself. And many of the healings seem to have been selected because these healings serve not only as divine confirmation, but also acted as teaching, as acted out teaching. Just as a parable is teaching, so a miracle is the teaching. In that sense, what the miracles teach, things about Jesus, is also part of the apostolic teaching found in the letters. But reference to the miracles themselves, we do not find. Now, of course, the letters make reference to the actual work of the Holy Spirit in the churches. So in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks extensively about the various ministries that are given by the Spirit to the church. And no kind of gifts of healing, etc., are all part of those. And I am wondering, but I'm just sort of very tentative here, it may well be that there is hardly any mention of the miracles Jesus did, because the churches themselves were experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit in their midst, on a very real basis. This is at least what the argument seems to be in Galatians chapter 3, verse 5, where Paul says, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So Paul refers to the ongoing presence of miracles amongst you and use that as an argument that no, it is actually hearing by faith that uh, affects this rather than uh, the works of the law. But there is something else, namely that the apostles, both in Acts and to a certain degree in the letters, are those that show like Jesus did, by signs and wonders that God is with them. I mean, this is what Paul basically says in Romans 15, um, where he says, No, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. How? By word and deed by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. So, Paul refers here to miracles he did during his ministry as a claim that indeed God approved of his apostolic ministry. Now, there we, we get, of course, the combination of power, signs, and wonders, the, the same three terms as Peter used in Acts 2. And we also have in Hebrews 2, is this Hebrews 2? Yeah. Uh, God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. But this is a witness 
as an approval of the word that is preached by the apostles and the eyewitnesses. It is not talking about the miracles that Jesus did. Um, so the early church lived in a situation where the signs and miracles of God's approval of the apostles were all around him and gifts of the Holy Spirit were distributed according to his will. And in this context, the lack of references to the signs of Jesus becomes slightly more understandable. Because if, if signs and wonders are happening around you with the apostles, with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, if that is happening, if that is part of your reality, how much more will that be the case when Jesus himself was on earth? That is, the miracles of Jesus would not add any persuasive force to the situation in the early church where all those things happened already. And I'm talking very specifically about the apostolic context here. But this is only tentatively. Um, I would like to look at the parables in the letters because parables, I mean, they are not unique to Jesus, but the frequency that Jesus used parables is quite unique. Can we find parables back in the New Testament teaching? Um, well, I'm happy to say parables are actually surprisingly fruitful. Um, parables are, of course, part of the spoken teaching of Jesus, and therefore they are already more likely to influence the teaching of the apostles. Um, there are two examples that should help us on the way of uh, a road to discovery. And we will start with the parable. Oh, I don't hope we're starting with this one. Uh, let me see. Oh. Uh, let me have a look. Sorry for the slight delay. Uh, Gosh, I'm getting uh, confused with my own. Let, let's see. Receive with meekness. Yeah, we start with the parable of the sower. Sorry. So read parable of the sower here. Um, what was the parable of the sower about? Um, <coughs> well, the parable of the sower is perhaps the most paradigmatic of all the parables of Jesus. It is the first major parable in both Mark and Matthew, and in Luke it is very prominent because it is the only one with an extensive explanation. Now, in this parable of the sower, Jesus explains to his disciples why the word is not accepted by everyone. No, seed that is sown on the road or shallow ground or amidst thorns will not produce fruit. In the explanation, Jesus applies this to how people hear the word or how people receive the word. And it is only those who hear with understanding who will bear fruit. Now, echoes of this parable occur throughout the New Testament. Uh, for example, James 1. Receive with meekness the implanted word. I mean, there is that, that adjective here, implanted. And implanted, James used it without hesitation with the word word. An implanted word, which is pretty much the basic assumption of the parable of the sower, where the word is something that is being sown and then grows, and if everything goes well, bears fruit. Um, so first it is the equation of word, logos, with something that is planted without further explanation. James assumes that a planted word is self-explanatory. It is something you should jump to immediately. 
And if you know indeed the parable of the sower, it is the most logical thing. You don't even think about the equation that's being made. Um, second is the notion of receiving the word, which is very similar to Mark 4.20, where those who bear fruit receive the word. And that the word is there to save those who hear, comes from the contact, is also found in Luke's amount, uh, account of the parable, where the devil snatches the word away so that they may not believe and be saved. Um, now, similar echoes of this sort of parable language, the same parable, we found in Colossians 1, 5, 6. But it is the word of the truth, no, the gospel, the message, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you. Now, of course, you don't need the parable to grasp the, the notion of that a word bears fruit, a message bears fruit. But when you know the parable, the logic becomes all the easier. It is language introduced by Jesus in, to, in order to understand how the word works its way. The word is something that bears fruit and grows, just as it does so in the parable. And it might even be that Paul's use of uh, the term uh, to receive the word in, for example, 1 Thessalonians 1.6, is used because it resonates so well with the framework set up by Jesus himself. Um, let me see, do I have a slide? No, I don't have a slide of it, but if you have a Bible, uh, try and find 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, because it is actually more interesting or uh, more convincing than it looks at first sight. 1 Thessalonians... Uh, one of the earlier letters of Paul. And I am there, so I hope you're there almost as well. Uh, where Paul says in verse 6, it's come to you and indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit. Oh, that's Colossians. Sure. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. Um, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word. How did they receive the word? What are the accompanying circumstances? In much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now, and here the, the working of the parable becomes very interesting because if you have the parable as background, you start to understand why Paul is doing what he is doing. In the parable, there were people who received the word and much affliction happened. And what happened with those people who received the word with much affliction? They died, became unfruitful. They were basically squashed by the brambles. Also in the parable, there were people who received the word with much joy. What happened to those? They grew up quickly, but as soon as the sun came, was withered. Uh, they withered and faded. And here Paul uses two of those elements from the parable. No, you received it under much affliction, under much distress. You have received it with joy, but you bore fruit. So he takes the two elements, and even though you know you received it in adverse circumstances you still bore fruit because you accepted it as the word of God that it is. So it is interesting how some of the elements from the parable are taken and then turned in order to make the argument uh, more forceful. Okay, that's about uh, the parable of the sower, uh, which was this one. So we go back <laughs> to the other one. The parable of the foolish and wise virgins. And when, when I was preparing the, the 
the Dutch version of this for tomorrow, I realized that nowadays this is called the, the parable of the foolish and wise meisjes. And I, I still chuckle about it. I'm, I'm going to use that term tomorrow, but so the meisje, that, that it's, it's, it sounds a little bit like six-year-old you know, sort of thing, but that's not what the thing is about. So read parable of the foolish and the wise virgins. Um, and what I want you uh, to do, it's probably a good thing, to turn to this passage. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 and 17. So we know the parable of the foolish and the wise virgins. It is set in the context of Jesus talking about the last things. Jesus talking about his return. And he basically said, no, that uh, there was a time that uh, uh, 10 virgins were preparing for the arrival of the bridegroom. And the bridegroom was delayed, so they all fell asleep. Uh, but five of them had prepared their lamps, five of them had not. And then there is a loud cry and they all wake up. And those that have oil go with the bridegroom. In, uh, into the, the hall to be forever with him, and those that are not, uh, have not been prepared, they miss out. So it's all set in, basically, the teaching about final things, about the return of Jesus. And this is then what, uh, what Paul says. Um, basically, the, the whole passage, I'll, we'll read it, says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Uh, let me... You see, it is afternoon, so none of us are as sharp as we are this morning, and that, that shows sort of in the order of my notes already. Um, now, question I want to ask first. Where did Paul got the notion of talking about people who, uh, who died as those who are fall asleep. Well, of course, it is already mentioned in the Old Testament that death is no, like being fallen asleep. Daniel used that term of the, those who have fallen asleep will, will rise from the dead, etc. So it is good Old Testament teaching. And we could draw a line from the Old Testament straight to Paul. But I would suggest that it may be better to draw a line first from Paul to Jesus and only then the line back to the Old Testament. Because Jesus was questioned about his use of falling asleep when talking about deceased people. Not once, but twice. Um, uh, the first one happens, of course, in the context of the... Uh, uh, daughter of Jairus. No, they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion, people wheeling, weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, um, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. So that, that's the first time we get this confusion about Jesus using, in itself, good Old Testament language. But... It was not understood. And the second time happens with his good friend Lazarus. 
Now, when Jesus talking to his disciples, after saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. And then Jesus answers openly that no, Lazarus has died. But again, there's a second time Jesus talking about falling asleep, and it is not picked up by the people around him. So I would suggest when Paul starts talking about those who are fallen asleep, at least it should raise the possibility that he is going back to terminology that the Lord Jesus took great pains in teaching his disciples, because twice he had to do that. Um, the second question I would have is this. Oh, wait with that one. Why does Jesus talk about or why does Paul talk, and I will leave it, about um, this I say to you by a word from the Lord. Now, many of us will have thought that if Paul says something like this, this I say to you by a word from the Lord, that he had you know, some special revelation in mind. And it is possible. But I would suggest when Paul uses this sort of language, he has actually Jesus' teaching in mind. He has something in mind where Jesus taught about these things. And I think that indeed what Paul is going to do now in the rest of the passage from Thessalonians is he is going to take the parable of the five foolish and five wise virgins. He picks up what happened to the wise virgins and uses that to explain to the Thessalonians that those who have fallen asleep will in no way be disadvantaged because they will go with Jesus together into the hall for the bridal uh, feast. And I think that this more or less should help us a bit. When Paul says, uh, no, we who are alive, who are left until uh, the coming of the Lord, coming of the Lord, yes, it signals that massive teaching of Jesus in Matthew 24, 25, um, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Um, then a bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. That is not a problem in the parable. It just happens because the bridegroom is delayed. There's, there's no problem in falling asleep. There is no problem for a Christian in that sense in dying. No, but we who survive will not precede those who have fallen asleep. And then we get the arrival of the groom in uh, the parable. But at midnight there was a cry. And Paul says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel. Yeah, because Jesus has the voice of an archangel, but in Matthew 24, 25, we had read, he will send out the angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect. And indeed, the trumpet is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4 with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then all those virgins rose. Uh, let's see, do we have another one? Yeah, that we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And they, they were there, those virgins, to meet the bridegroom. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And so we who are ready, whether asleep or still alive, will always be like the Lord. Um, why does, do I think that Paul uses this particular parable? Well, I think for at least two reasons. The first of which is that it comes out of Jesus' own teaching. 
on his parousia, on his coming. And second, because the link here is that the Thessalonians are concerned about those who are falling asleep. And the parable of the ten virgins has a link to those who have fallen asleep, of course. Um, and Paul knew him, himself knew very well that the point of the full parable is what Jesus says in the end, Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore, uh, for you know neither the day nor the hour, which Paul then picks up in 1 Thessalonians 5, using the same Greek term, let us watch, let us stay awake. Okay, two parables that may have sort of an influence in the teaching of Jesus. Which brings us to the next question we need to answer. Um, what was the form in which the church knew the teaching of Jesus? So, did they know it in the form as it is written in the gospel? All those nice little uh, sections, no pericopes, where we put a heading above it and then move on to the next story in the gospel. Uh, what was it? Or did they just know the rough story, as, as we know the rough stories about Jesus? Uh, how did they know it? Well, let's start again with a recap so that we know where we are. Um, we have seen that the teaching of Jesus was used by the apostles when they wrote their letters, sometimes explicit, that they, and they mention that they have a word of the Lord or a command of the Lord. But most of the time, implicit, they just cite Jesus' word and you are supposed to pick it up. And that indicates that the audience had good access to the teaching of Jesus, and I think they also had good access to the parables in that way. Um, so how are we going to answer that question about what was the shape in which the church knew the teaching of Jesus? Well, let's go to Paul in 1 Corinthians, because I think it is clearest from what's happening in this letter. Um, so instead of looking for the words of Jesus in the Gospels and then trying to find the letters, is there anything about Jesus? Um, we have been scouring the letters of the apostles to see how his words influenced what was written there. What do they write about how they have handed down the teaching of Jesus? And there is only one chapter in which this is discussed openly, and that's 1 Corinthians 11. Um, he says in chapter 2, Now I commend you, this is one of the very few places where he gives a compliment to the church in Corinth, but at least, no, there was something. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything. That's a good thing, even though they did not agree with Paul all the time. At least they remembered him in everything. And maintain the traditions even as I deliver them to you. That's interesting. Paul talks about remembering him and remembering what Paul had handed down to the church in Corinth. Now, earlier there was uh, some question about, yeah, but when were things written down then? No, because if you have a writing that is for us such a natural thing to do to preserve something. Well, here Paul praises the Corinthians to maintaining to the traditions just as he delivered them to. And I don't think he is referring to written stuff here. I think it is still uh, you know, guarded by that remembering bit that is going on. Um, the Corinthians had kept the traditions intact in the form in which Paul had handed them down. So Paul assumes that there is a fixed form for these traditions. It was not just, no, I teach you in a sermon about Jesus, and then you can repeat the sermon in your own words after it. But Paul praises them for keeping them as he had delivered them. That's an important one here. Uh, it would be very neat if those traditions 
are identical to the stories we find in the Gospels. Couldn't it? So, so let, let's see where, where that thought takes us. And again, I'm going for the maximalist model. Uh, um, well, um, we're going straight to, uh, to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, same chapter where Paul starts by uh, saying that he delivered to the Corinthians what he also received. This is in the introduction of 1 Corinthians 11. So Paul had handed over what he was handed down. And it is all the, the, the Greek word uh, paradidomai. And then Paul starts saying in 1 Corinthians 11, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And surprise, surprise, Paul is following here, you know, phrase by phrase, how Luke later on would write down the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper. There are some minute differences, but then Paul is referring to stuff that the Corinthians already knew. And Paul reminds them, these are the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper. Make sure you don't abuse it. Because if you put Luke 22 next to it, then the took bread is identical. When he had given thanks, identical. He broke it, okay, look at, no, and gave it to them. And sat saying, okay, I'll forgive you that differences, no? Uh, this is my body, which is for you. This is my body, which is given for you. Okay, that's that extra word. Um, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same is true for the cup. No? In the same way, also, he took the cup and likewise the cup. After supper, after they had eaten. Again, this is a difference introduced by the translators. And in the Greek, those terms are identical, which is an, an interesting one. So, after supper, after supper, uh, saying, saying, this cup, this cup that is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. And that is repeated in both places. So, here we have... And it is the only passage where we find in the letters an explicit reference to things that Jesus had said and Jesus had done. Because this is not just teaching of Jesus. This is not just what Jesus said. It is also what Jesus did. He gave thanks. He broke bread. And even those narrative elements, which are not part of what Jesus' own words, but how Jesus did those things, seem to have been in a pretty fixed format by the time Luke or John Paul. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. We get there in, in the end. Um, so this is at least the positive evidence we have from the letters themselves that, at their, if you want to say minimalist, that at least some parts of the gospel, but if I say maximalist, that large parts of the gospel were made, no, uh, were remembered, were transmitted within the churches in a pretty fixed format. Um, but does tradition, is, it, is that sort of an equal word to the stories about Jesus? Well, before we jump to the wrong conclusion, um, here I, I can't be as maximalist as I would like to have, perhaps. But uh, um, the word tradition is not a specific technical term in the letters for the individual parts of the Gospels or the individual parts of the teaching of Jesus. Uh, Jesus. Now, the term tradition is broader than this and includes, according to Paul himself, also the teaching that he has given to the church outside the direct teaching of the life of Jesus. 
mean, this is how he uses the word in 2 Thessalonians 2.15. No, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us. And where can we find those traditions? Either by our spoken word or by our letter. So Paul includes his own letter in the traditions that have been given, but explicitly distinguishes traditions that have been spoken to him and now also include the letters that he has written. Well, that is sort of interesting that we get the inclusion of letters here in the tradition that needs to be cherished by the church. Because these are the first signals that tell us that the traditions would be written down. That in the course of the history of the early church, there was indeed a time that the written stuff would become more and more important. Um, I want to go back to that expression we had in 1 Corinthians 11, 2, namely where Paul said, just as I delivered them to you. I hope you remember those words and I'm not making them up. Because uh, we get them back, th that term, in how Luke introduces his gospel. So it is time now, finally, to start a little bit of a gospel and, and see what it tells about itself. So what does the gospel tell about the precise form in which the apostles taught the words of Jesus? And it is fair, then, to read what the Gospels say about themselves. Luke is most explicit when it comes to what exactly he is doing. So this is the introduction to Luke. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. There's a lot to unpack there, and I'm not going to unpack everything there is to unpack, but let's do a little bit. First of all, um, Luke does not pretend to write anything new. No, verse 4 tells us that he writes so that Theophilus can know the certainty of things he had been taught already. So Luke claims for his gospel that it, the gospel is there to affirm the certainty of things that Theophilus already had been taught. So that is an important one. That's a function of what the gospel says it is. And he says that um, the acts, the things that have happened, had already been delivered to us. So Luke basically says here that he is the second generation when it comes to the, uh, the things that we were talking about, the things of the gospel. There was, of course, Jesus. Then there are those who, from the beginning, were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. They delivered them to us. And then there is Luke writing down. And the next generation is Theophilus, who had been taught these things, now also being, reading them. So they delivered them to us. But that's the same language Paul used in 1 Corinthians 11. The traditions delivered to you. Um, and then we, we get the, uh, the description of the people who did that delivering of the traditions. Namely, those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. Now, if you would need to find one word that, cover, that covers those who 
from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. What would that word be, according to Luke's thing? Apostles. Because that is how he, you know, we have read it in Acts 10, that Jesus commanded that those who, beginning from the baptism of John, all the way down, had eaten with him, etc., and they are to preach the gospel. So, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, just as the apostles have delivered them to us. So, in short, um, Luke tells us at the opening of his gospel book that what he writes has been delivered, handed down by those who are eyewitness, and that Theophilus receives this book in order to be assured of the firmness of the things that he had been taught already. So Luke's expressed goal in writing is that he brings the teaching of the apostles about Jesus to his readership. Um, I need to say a little bit about uh, the history of New Testament scholarship here. Um, and you, you can switch off and I'll tell you when to switch on uh, again. But uh, basically, though, a third way of learning about the exact form in which the apostles taught the church, you know, the words of Jesus, is to look at the individual gospel stories themselves. Uh, and it, it is easy to very easy, actually, to get confused by the serious amount of biblical scholarship there is on this point. At some point in the early 20th century, uh, a school of thinking started that recognized that the individual gospel stories uh, showed all sorts uh, of signs of being individual oral traditions. You could categorize all the individual stories. There are the miracle stories, there are the conflict stories, etc. And all seem to form a certain pattern. And quite often they have all sorts of similar length, in a sense. So you, you could categorize those stories and talk about them as individual oral traditions. If you take, for example, the conflict stories of Mark 2 and 3, you can see that there is a pattern in which they are told. Now, and starting from this observation, there was a whole school called Form Criticism, or in the German Formgeschichte, and they claimed to be able to take an individual story and peel off the various layers that were added by Christians who told this story when they were in the Palestinian context and then added by Christians who were in the Hellenistic context and then the elements that were added by Christians in the Greco-Roman context. And if you peel off all these layers, then you are left with yeah, something, not very big, but something. And that little something is only what we can know about the historical Jesus, basically. Um, now, uh, there has been some, uh, some criticism of this movement, and I think rightly so. Um, and some of the best arguments against this approach come from uh, Richard Borkham, uh, a re retired New Testament professor from St. Andrews, a truly original thinking, uh, thinker. I mean, he made clear that the Gospels are intended to be eyewitness testimony. So rather than break it up into uh, things that have just come together by, by some miracle of history, uh, the, store, the Gospels are designed as being eyewitness testimony. That is, what the Gospels are seems to preclude an understanding of the individual stories as bits that are floating around, were changed and shaped by communities, and then found their way eventually in written form. Now, Gospels need to be understood as a unified testimony. And this is indeed a big step forward. But we should not forget that there was a time that this eyewitness testimony as Formgeschichte correctly said, that it only existed in memory form, in oral form. And we can 
indeed uh, recognize these individual teaching units within the larger gospel. We can indeed talk about you know, all sorts of stories that you can start to compare with one another. And the shape of the gospels with all those individual short stories seems to be indeed still a reflection of the time when the gospel was not written down, where there are no written sources, but where there was just the oral memory on, of the teaching of the apostles. Um, the gospels may have been taught as a coherent whole, and memory studies helps us that you, know, uh, you can have memory of a large group of individual stories, but this coherent grand narrative consists of individual units that were remembered and taught as such. Now, when the gospel story was written down, as Luke told us uh, earlier, the authors of the story were constrained by the way in which the churches knew the gospel already. That is, when Luke started to write things down, he could not freely edit everything he received in the way he could. No, he was constrained more or less by what was already out there. And every parent know this, knows this sort of thing. Um, and if you have little children who have a favorite children's book, which needs to be read completely before bedtime, and if as a parent you dare to skip a page or summarize a page, you're being told off immediately. No, that is not how the story goes. Now, of course, that is children's stuff. But when we are talking about the churches who had been taught the story of Jesus already, and then we get no, a look, and he starts omitting stuff, changing stuff, changing the way a story flows, of course, he would be told off. Though he had some freedom to talk about, just as you can put the animal noises in when you read your story to the, to the children, that is no problem as such. He had some editorial freedom. There was also a way in which he was uh, constrained by what he could do. And we find a good example of the restraint of oral tradition in the story of the uh, healing of the paralyzed man, no? the one who was uh, lowered down through, through the roof, where we get in all three of the gospel this very strange sentence, where we said, no, Jesus talking, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, and then Jesus, no, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. So we have here one sentence of Jesus with two different addressees. The first one is said to the scribes and Pharisees, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then we get that editorial interruption he said to the man who was paralyzed, so Jesus turning from one group to the other, I say to you, pick up your bed and go home. Um, this is quite a unique construction when it comes to the sort of uh, sentence, how it is built up in the Gospels. Uh, I, I don't think it, it is parale uh, paralleled in, in the same way. But all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have this same broken sentence. And to me, it seems that it was not that they thought, oh, this is such a brilliant literary move, we keep it in our text. But this seems to me much easier to understand as this was how the story was taught, how it was remembered, and therefore, they were stuck with this very dramatic sentence. But I could imagine that especially Luke, in his style of Greek, would have itched perhaps and, well, I can make this slightly more fluent than what it is right now. 
but constrained by the oral tradition. Um, let's see, we're going to wrap up this uh, second lecture. At least, how far are we in? 20 minutes in, or? It will be a bit shorter then. Okay, so, yeah. good. Okay, so I have a little bit to wrap up and then we have time for questions. Um, now, we are not going into all the details of the actual writing of the Gospels. And there is a lot to be uh, work to be done there. Um, so, uh, as you may know, I am not as optimistic as some people that we can really untangle the precise literary relationship between the Gospels. Why am I not very optimistic? Because there is such an enormous influence of the existing oral tradition on it. And it's very difficult to say this is a development of the oral tradition by Luke, or this is a development of Matthew, or something that Luke had said. So, so there, there is that, that uncertainty that constantly uh, is there. But, but still, there is very good, precise work to be done, and there is a lot of precise uh, knowledge to be gained here. Um, what we did today, so far, is starting with the actual history of Jesus encountering people, you know, healing, teaching, and his death and resurrection. And these things were only remembered and understood properly after the resurrection, once the Holy Spirit had come, once the disciples knew that it was Jesus who would conquer death. It was the Spirit who would remind the disciples of everything Jesus had done. So on top of the actual historical events, we get the specific teaching of the apostles. Now, not all the apostles will have taught Jesus in exactly the same way. They, they will have added their personal, uh, personal um, color to it. The Gospel of Mark is often associated with Peter, for example. And now I'm, I'm pretty, pretty prepared to, to take that as fairly accurate. I can't see anything against it. And so it is the Gospel of Mark, but it may be a reflection of how Peter taught the Gospel of Jesus. And Mark's language is, again, it is second language Greek. Uh, it is great to learn Greek because it is simple Greek, but it is not really how an accomplished native speaker would use the language all the time. He combines all his uh, uh, sentences with and, 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 while all the others, they use a bit more variety of conjunctions. So, so Mark shows the, uh, all the signs of being written by somebody or spoken by somebody who... Uh, with Greek as his second language, and would fit Peter, possibly. Um, but then, even some of the difference between the Gospels, uh, so can be different ways in which the apostles taught the words of Jesus, but it can also be due to the person who wrote it down. So I take, okay, Matthew wrote Matthew, good. Luke wrote Luke, uh, but... What, what is Luke's particular take on things? Well, Luke had a big project in mind with the story of the early church, and Luke is normally associated with Paul. And we saw already a good example in Corinthians compared to the institution of the Lord's Supper in, uh, in Luke. So it may be that we have something there. Um, and then finally, of course, the people who wrote the gospel down are allowed to use their own personality, their own skills, because God never suppresses the person who he uses. There's always something of the person in there, because that is how God works. And then as a final complication, 
No, the counterbal to counterbalance the impression that the Gospels evolved further and further away from one another, then there is the influence of the many shared elements of the oral teaching of what Jesus did. Um, the possibility of an evangelist may have read another one. Luke says that he knew about other written Gospels. So we have to allow for that possibility. But what I think what we get here is a, at least three or four different possible influences, all sort of uh, intertwined and affecting one another, which is perhaps extremely difficult to untangle. But at least I have a historical model to understand how this situation came into being. And then there is, of course, the active role for the work of the Holy Spirit in all this. Now, this is a short account of how the Gospels came into being. And it shows perhaps why I'm not as optimistic to solve the synoptic problem, if there is a problem, to be honest, uh, than some of uh, other scholars are. Um, well, in the adverts for today, uh, in the advertising, there was the promise that I would explain why the Gospels were written down. I mean, what was the reason uh, that the apostles made the move to at least allow the teaching about Jesus to be written down? So we started with the New Covenant. Everything is remembered. We have ended up with the Gospels as written material. Is there something more to learn about that final move? Why were the Gospels written down in the end? What is the theological rationale? So we're not going into synoptic problem in the next lecture, but we are trying to understand what the historical factors were that the New Testament ended up as being completely written combination of 27 fantastic books. But we'll do that after our break.